venous thromboembolism is a common and life-threatening condition in outpatients with cancer. Now, the question becomes, how do you lower the morbidity and the mortality, not to mention the costs associated with VTE in this patient population? To do that, we're talking about a late-breaking clinical trial on a rivaroxaban thromboprophylaxis. It's in high-risk ambulatory cancer patients receiving systemic therapy, and these are the results of a randomized clinical trial, the Cassini trial. First off, thank you very much. I'm with Dr. Alok Karana, who is an MD and a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine and also chair of oncology uh, there at the Tosse Cancer Institute. So the question I have is really you're trying to figure out the role for extended thromboprophylaxis in this patient population. Why is it so difficult? It's difficult because we're talking about a really long period of time because cancer patients, you know, we, we're used to doing thromboprophylaxis when patients go into the hospital, but that's for like three days, five days, seven days. We're used to doing thromboprophylaxis after hip or knee surgery, but that's also for a couple of weeks. We are talking about, you know, a six month time frame or a three month time frame. And so we're in a different ballpark here and we want to make sure if you're recommending blood thinners to patients for that long period of a time, that they're safe and that they, they're effective and help patients have better outcomes. So describe the high-risk patients you were looking at in Cassini. Yeah. So there have been other trials of outpatient thromboprophylaxis that have been done before. Uh, the two large ones were Protect and Save Onco. They came out about several years ago. And they were statistically significant. So they showed a reduction in events, but a lot of people questioned whether they were clinically significant because the event rates were really low. They were you know, 3% down to 1.2%, somewhere in that range. And so the number needed to treat to prevent one event was in the range of 50 or so. Uh, and that's you know, asking 50 patients to take a, you know, a shot every day for six months or four months, whatever the time frame was, depending on the trial, uh, to prevent one of them from having to take a shot every day you know, for a longer period of time. It, it just, that, those numbers don't add up. So in Cassini, what did you do? Right, so in Cassini, we focused on a high-risk population, and we've spent a lot of time over the past, you know, 10 years or so trying to define what high-risk is. Yes. And exactly. so we have a score called, you know, the Corona score that looks at formally identifying patients at high risk for getting events. Uh, and so we only focused on patients with locally advanced or metastatic disease, with solid tumors or lymphomas, with a Corona score of two or higher. And those patients were randomized to receive rivaroxaban 10 milligram once a day, or placebo, once a day, and then they were followed for a 180-day period. And what did you find? Well, we found a lot of different things. One is we found that the drug works if you're taking it. So a lot of patients took the drug, but after some time period, because they were switching their chemotherapy regimen or the cancer was progressing, for a multitude of reasons, they stopped taking the drug. And the drug suppressed the rate of clots while they were on it, and then the clots sort of went, went back up after, after patients stopped taking it, which you know, makes sense in this sick population. So the results were statistically significant with a really high absolute risk reduction of about 4%, so 6.5% down to 2, 2, 2 point something percent uh, over, over the on-treatment period. But they're not as significant when looking at the full 180-day period because almost 40% of clots occurred after patients stopped taking the drug. So a couple lessons right there. The drug's effective in reducing clots, but you've got to stay on the drug to prevent clots from happening. The good news is we definitely found a high thrombotic rate population. If you add up the primary endpoint events, the secondary endpoint events, plus we screened some of these patients at baseline to see if they had a pre-existing clot. There was a 4.5% rate right there. We're looking at 17% rate of some type of thrombotic event through, through the six-month time frame. So this is a high-risk population, no question about it. And we can substantially reduce the risk with, uh, with a once-a-day blood thinner, and then safety is you know, obviously an issue with any blood thinner. Yeah, what, did, what bleeding did you see? Yeah, incidence of major bleeding was low, so it was 0.9% for placebo and 1.9% for, uh, for rivaroxaban. The number needed to harm, so you know, for right. one, uh, one major bleeding event was 101, which is really high, and the number needed to harm for a clinically relevant non-major bleeding event was even higher at 135. Uh, and there were no other adverse event signals that were identified. So we are pretty reassured about the safety of this approach. I mean, what's interesting is in cardiology, this approach has worked in some settings, but not in others. So here, the corona risk score really cut off that, that two or higher, correct? That seems to identify the cancer patients at high risk. And those are the ones you're targeting. Yep, exactly. So that's kind of the take home message. Exactly. Should the Cassini results right now, as they stand, start influencing people when they're considering guidelines? That's definitely something we would say. Um, I should mention that there's actually a second trial with a very similarly designed population. So they also focused on 
solitimer patients and a corona score of two or higher uh, that's been run by the Canadian investigators, Phil mm -hmm. Wells and Mark Carrier. And those results completed roughly around the same time as ours did, and the expectation is that those findings will be re revealed very soon. And if that's the case and those findings are positive, then having two positive trials, I think, definitely would influence uh, recommendations for guidelines. My opinion. I'm a, I'm a guidelines panel member, so I don't want to speak for the guidelines, but yeah.